You are now locked into Radio Juxtapose, the home of contemporary art and culture conversation. Coming up today. My initial reaction, I don't think that's a fair re reflection on how I like to create work. I know three weeks removed from that, it just isn't going to connect with me the same. I would like to capture the fact that these these things still exist and they're still present, you know, in our world or in our lives. Like imagine someone made a painting after watching Tiger King. Like we're so, that, that feels like <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> this is Radio Juxtapose. It's been a couple of weeks since we checked in with you guys. Have you been? You're looking after yourselves. I know I can't hear your response, but you know, sometimes it's just nice to be asked. What a couple of weeks it's been though. That dystopian calm from coronavirus has been replaced with an eruption of anger and action as thousands upon thousands have taken to the streets to protest the murder of George Floyd, which has once again opened up old wounds in countries burdened with the weight of their own history. Each and every time this conversation takes centre stage, we realise how much more still needs to be done. I don't know about you, but my screen time has gone through the roof. On today's episode, Evan's in conversation with the painter Marcus Brutus to talk about his approach at bringing a slightly more subdued reflection of the African-American experience into the cultural dialogue. Thanks to everyone for the continued support of Radio Juxtapose. If you don't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel from wherever you are in from. And if you enjoy what we do, then why not drop us a wee review, say something nice. Before we get into the interview with Marcus, I wanted to check in with Ev to see how the mood was over in San Francisco. Be sure to stick around afterwards as we both try to dissect our thoughts on how the art world has or hasn't responded to the issue of racial equality. Enjoy the episode. Yeah, so uh, the podcast we have this week, uh, Marcus Brutus, um, a wonderful painter um, based in Queens, New York. Uh, he was in the spring issue. Uh, he has an upcoming solo show with Harper's Books uh, in, I believe that's in East Hampton out in Long Island. Um, he mentioned it. Um, the reason why I wanted to talk to him and the reason why I actually sort of a, it was going to be a podcast but kind of not, but now where it is, now it is a podcast, um, is that he does, you know, I think I talked to him about it in the podcast, but um, that just the idea of the everyday, like the stuff in between, and that um, it seems like in the media, uh, white media loves to just celebrate like tragedy and celebrity and nothing in between. And Marcus Brutus's paintings are literally all those moments in between. And that's kind of like almost his exact mission statement. Um, so it seemed like a very appropriate person to talk, to just have on the podcast this week. You know, that kind of the whole tiger thing, king thing, like, uh, you know, that, that you don't make the art in the knee jerk reaction moment, you know, you wait and you contemplate and then you, you just process and then you try and reflect on something. But, and I wasn't, I felt not, I, I didn't feel confident saying that part where I was where I was like you know white people only you know we only look at tragedy within the black community and then we look at like the stars and like we never really focus on just what it is to like have a barbecue on a Monday you know like there's just it's it's weird that that's kind of how you grow up in America you, all you think about is like the is just like tragedy and it doesn't seem like that's the the way to heal and the way to get better is to think about all the things in between and that's how you that's how i feel and i i felt really unconfident asking him that i will say that i don't know if that, this is off the record or what but i felt oh no this was going in with that <laughs> okay um i felt uncomfortable only only because i'm still working out like all the all the things that are subconscious in my head that I don't ever think about because I've lived for 38 years in a, in a world that's all about how white male history is the, you know, it's just, you don't, so you're working it out in front of people, which is em embarrassing, but it's, you gotta it's just okay, get over man. it and you just gotta that's do it. That's the thing. It's like, it's yeah. okay. No, We're, for sure. You know, yeah. as a white guy, you're going to get this wrong. You're going to get it wrong. 
again and again and we have to get okay with that you know we might ask the wrong question right. we might say yeah. the wrong thing we might deliver something in the wrong way our tone might be off or our you know just even sometimes potentially just our presence in certain situations might might not be what's needed in certain conversations but we are going to get it wrong and we have to be okay with that we have to be okay with just taking a step back with asking the questions and being you know and being open to being slightly vulnerable about things because that's the only way this is going to get better that's the only way we are going to move and this is what's different about this is what's different about what's happening now the white people are talking the white people are talking to each other i've had so many conversations with uh friends of mine who i've talked to tried to talk to and engage with stuff like this before and then it's just it's never really gone anywhere and now they're like okay let, let's kind of let's, let's talk a little bit more you know okay what well, have you been you know i've been listening to this podcast i've read this book and you're like okay cool like this is this is it this is the start of the conversation and it's okay to not just like listen to one podcast from you know a person of color and then suddenly just be like okay cool i i get it all i'm 100 percent. it's like it's 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 and you know it's a process that can take you a lifetime and you just have to be okay with the fact that you know you're gonna be uncomfortable <laughs> Do you say something? Uh, hey, my name is Marcus Brutus. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus Brutus, maybe the best name in the art world. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there, there are many people that ask me if it's real. And I'm like, I, out of all the names that I could choose, if I were going to choose a fake name, I wouldn't choose Marcus Brutus. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got like... <laughs> Obviously, it's got a historically regal kind of ring to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I have to be honest. Like, I think Marcus Brutus, it, he sort of gets um, that whole, like, Roman and Greek era of history. You kind of, like, go through, like, at a point in your time as a kid, like, where you don't really pay attention. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, it's it's not, like, the most, <laughs> like, you're like, I'm so tuned into this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Uh... Just living with the name, people, like, even when strangers would, like, either find out that's my name, they'd like to ask me, like, do you know who that is or the origin of the name? And they'd kind of just, like, bring it up all the time. And I was just like, honestly, like, uh, my dad named me Marcus, one, because, like, it, it was, like, almost in passing because, like, our last name is Brutus. He, you know, he he's kind of into like literature and Shakespeare and things like that. So that's also partially a reason why, but it, it wasn't like this like real thought out thing. He doesn't really explain it as like being <laughs> this like real kind of, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm i Greek and Italian and somehow I have a Welsh name. So I don't know. I yeah. don't know. Like, <laughs> like, I don't know what parents, like you're 28. Is that how old you are? Yeah, 28. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how like the nineties were when people were naming people, but like in the eighties, it seemed like anything went, which brings me to my next question. We, we talked about Wes Unseld and for like most people here who are going to listen to an art podcast are probably like, what? (laughs) But I, there's something about the seventies that I think resonates with your work in some sort Mm. of weird way after you said that. And, but also I just kind of wanted to talk about like, why like growing up in dc like what what growing up in like the dc area was like for you in the 90s because even though we were talking about the 70s i'm just kind of curious about that that time yeah um well my parents are both haitian immigrants okay Um, they they both came in at as both as teenagers they met here but they were you know they both got to dc as teenagers and uh, essentially by the age of five, I was living in like the suburbs of uh, uh, Maryland, like right outside of Washington, D.C. And at that time growing up, because this is sort of like during the, you know, the crack epidemic and there's like poverty and all of this. I wasn't really in D.C. that much other right. than like this, like if you, you know, take a random trip to go visit like the the White, like look at the White House and all the right. wa- and the Washington Monument and things like that. So there was like this, and like there was like this kind of fear amongst older people about 
traveling to the city other than like but both my parents worked in dc at, at the time so okay. i would go back to their like to their jobs and things like that but um it was it was kind of like as i got to my teenage years that i kind of began to explore and, and things like that yeah. yeah it's it's interesting because um i feel like the idea of suburban dc is something that uh I don't often hear about. I, I had a, I had some family friends that lived in Bethesda, Maryland. Yeah, yeah. When I was a kid, so I had gone there. But I don't, you know, I, I don't know much about growing up in suburban D.C., but I know there was, like, a really intense, like, punk music scene and that kind of stuff. But I, it was never my, that was never my thing. So I didn't yeah. really know. Well, everyone in suburban or, like, around uh, D.C. works, essentially works for the federal government. In some right, exactly. Of, yeah, in yeah, direct yeah. or direct <laughs> capacity. So what's interesting is you have like uh, Prince George's County, which is a relatively affluent uh, African-American, predominantly African-American county. Uh, and, and, you know, all of the all of the professionals there service and work in, you know, in, in D.C. In DC. So you, you kind of and, and also there's um, there's just it, it's growing up there. There are so many different sort of it was such a diverse area. Like, I mean, culturally, ethnically, like, uh, so, you know, growing up, I, I had friends that were all like, you know, their parent, their, their family were West African immigrants or from, there's a large Ethiopian, uh, and, and Eritrean, uh, community there. So yeah, it, it's there in, you know, Central American, there's like a, a large Central American, uh, population there. So I kind of grew up exposed and in, in, in and amongst and around different cultures um, as well as um, there was a there was also uh, the presence of class with amongst black communities or um, economic class you know within the black communities or you know other ethnic minority communities so you, like you would see you know there are very impoverished areas in Maryland and DC but then there are also very affluent areas as well that were predominantly African American and so on. So it, it, it was a very interesting place to grow up. I, I always wondered this, and I, you know, I was we uh, I interviewed uh, this this gentleman Chip Thomas the other day, who is a, a artist, activist, and physician who lives on the Navajo Nation. Mm -hmm. And what I asked him about was that if it was a Republican or Democrat in office, does it matter? on the Navajo Nation? Like, does the conditions change? No, he said nothing changes. But when you're growing up in suburban DC, if there's a Republican or Democratic regime, does it change anything, do you think, in reflection? Um, see, I, I've, I, only, I've only been there for the Clinton and for the yeah. Obama years. I've never been there during a different time. Yeah, okay. Um, honestly, I, I wouldn't really know, but yeah. the first sort of, I was first like aware of like the first election that I was kind of like cognizant and aware of was the 2000 election right. of George of George W. Bush. So right. there was kind of like this uncertainty because this is like most of my life it was Clint Clinton was in office. So there was like this uncertainty with like the transitioning <laughs> into a Republican, uh, a, right. uh, you know, sort of. Um, uh, period. So I wouldn't know, you know, honestly, but like if you if you look at D.C. local politics, they've predominantly had uh, Democratic mayors. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Black mayors. Uh, you know, one of the most famous mayors there is uh, Mar Mayor Marion Barry. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, honestly, I couldn't tell. But there, you know, what's interesting is amongst all of this kind of uh, diversity, you do, like, if you travel to, like, areas like Bethesda and, and Potomac and so on, like, that kind of, that would be a bit more of a different kind of culture. Like, they're, they're, like they, they, they would be maybe, you know, at that time growing up, they were probably more of a Republican stronghold in that area, you know? Yeah, it, it definitely felt... I mean, the, the people I knew there came from like a pretty cool area of LA and then moved there. And it was definitely different for them. Yeah. Just going from California to go there. It's interesting because I was, look, you know, looking at your paintings and 
made more sense to talk to you on this when the spring issue was out, but like the pandemic basically killed a lot of momentum. I kind of got a little, I don't know. I personally got a little demotivated to do things, but no. yeah. Are you a nostalgic person? Because yeah. your paintings have a little bit of that nostalgia, but they don't also, they're, they're not like you, there's evidence that they exist now too. Yeah. I, I, like I've always, for some reason, like, History was just like probably the name, my name, <laughs> but history has always been like my favorite subject. So like anything that I'm into, I have to sort of, I like to tie into history and kind of like understand the entire background and kind of the legacy of things. And it, it's, it's always been my, you know, whether, you know, in discussion, that's always like my su supporting kind of evidence is looking back at history and kind of comparing it and, and and things like that also kind of you know like with now with what's going on you know with uh you know all of the calls against police brutality and police violence like that's not a new thing so i think it's it, it helps when you shed light to things and you can kind of show like hey this is an ongoing thing that you know right. that that's been you know that's that's been you know the cries have been going on for for a long time so yeah it, it's it's I'm I'm pretty nostalgic, but I'm not sort of like I don't really like to glorify the past either. Like I'm not I'm not one of those people that are kind of like oh everything was great then and you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because okay, you aren't doing. I'm working this out as I speak, so this isn't like some free. <laughs> no, that's cool. You you aren't you aren't doing like these major grand gestures of history. You're not like you're at the the thing that I. I loved about your work. The first time I saw it in person was at Expo uh, Chicago. You had just had the solo show, I believe, at Harper's the summer yeah. before. And I knew, so I knew of your work. But when I walked into your booth, even my dad, who doesn't know much about art, he was with me on that trip. He was like, oh, this is my favorite. Oh, and it cool. was like, I was like, all right, so why is this your favorite? Because this is my favorite too. And he goes, because it's it's just, it's it's the simple things in between all this, all these other grand political and statements I'm seeing around me, like these are actually just the real life stuff. And I think that that's maybe like why I was, when you were talking about how you liked Wes Unsell, <laughs> or just when you posted that, I was thinking to myself like, yeah, like this, it's like Wes Unsell, although he's like a hall of famer, like unsung hero kind of thing, you know? And yeah. I think that really connects with what you're doing with your work. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I like to, well, I always kind of like the everyday look at things. Like, even if you, like, track, if, we, if you want to talk basketball, like, if you were it. to sit and think of, like, the 80s or, you know, you, you'd talk about, like, the Showtime Lakers and all that. But you wouldn't, like, if, you're, if you kind of think now when you watch the NBA, there are all these names that, you know, all these guys, they may not always make the all-star team or they may not be the MVPs, but they're, 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 they're important and they, they kind of, they they were such important and, and significant features of like your everyday life or your everyday sports intake. So I kind of try to think in that way. Like even if I want to sort of shed light on a moment in history or point in time, it's like we live with these things every day. Like you're, you know, like, yes, you'll have times when you're extremely sad or extremely happy. But most times, like, you're just kind of casually walking by and there's going to be like, Someone might have a, a a Trump poster on their lawn, or a bomb, or a Obama bumper sticker, things like that. You're not always sort of actively engaging with all of these things, but they're all signifiers of kind of a point in time or an era. Right. It, it, it's like uh, for anybody who, if anyone, get, I mean, I hope someone gets this. It's like for the for me as a Golden State Warrior fans, it's like the Sean Livingston. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the total glue guy who who like is so important but he's not steph curry or clay thompson mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. kind of like what i when i was looking at your paintings i feel like it's like the really good it's like the sean livingston yeah that's is, like <laughs> a super compliment if anyone knows basketball that is a major compliment yeah no yeah thank you no i appreciate that uh, yeah it's it's like those are yeah it's just stories like that to me you know because i think especially when you're dealing with framework that is focused on sort of, you know, blackness, like people can so easily get caught up in sort of icon iconography and like 
black power fist and all of these kind of signifiers, but there's no, yeah, yeah. It, because it's such an easy entry point, there's, you, you can kind of get away with not having any sort of substance attached to it. So I, I kind of like to try to, to just kind of really break things down where it's just not like, it's not just like an easy kind of thing where you don't have to explain it any further. Like I, 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 I'd like, like, I wouldn't want to create these paintings or create anything or I'm not drawn to anything where you, you know, there's no, there's no real story that's attached to it where you can kind of just get away with, you know, like, all right, I'm not going to press that issue too much. It's kind of, I kind of feel like I, it's clear cut with what you're trying to say. Like, no, I kind of want to invite people to kind of spark conversations and kind of say, okay, this, I've never really seen this in this kind of manner. Like, can you kind of, you know, kind of, yeah. you know, show me like what you like, what, like, what is the significance of this or that, you know? I think that's, it's interesting. And I, I mean, we're 15 minutes in, we're like going right into politics. So let's do it. Um, <laughs> it's in the air. Like we can't, you can't, yeah. you, ha you have to talk about it. But I think what I think white people need to sort of come to what they need to improve on and really, especially everyone who's all the positive energy right now about supporting black artists and, and, and supporting black voices right now is great. And it's a little, always a little problematic because it's on social media. So you're like, is this a trend? Come on, people. Like we got to make sure this gets off social media and, but it's, I think for white people, we seem to only celebrate like the moments of pain and the moments of celebrity and not anything in between. And that's the part where I think like as an editor of a magazine and as just a person of the world, like I need to improve the focus on the everyday and not just like the polars, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think no. that's something that like, I, I want the discussion to move to at some point. No, yeah, like one of the early sort of inspirations for me really was like a guy like William Eggleston, where he yes. really just captured just like the mundane, yet it yeah. felt so powerful. Or like you would just, if you kind of just stare at anything, like anything like that, you know, just a bit like longer than five seconds, like so much begins to get revealed. So I, you know, I, yeah, and it's just like, if you want to bring it back to sort of politics, it's like that kind of is what Black Lives Matter means. It's like your yeah. your life is significant regardless if there are these, you know, grandiose accolades attached to your name or in things like that. Yeah, and then like I think it's perfect because one, like your book, uh, Americans. Yeah. I, I can't, <laughs> how do you, how, how do you, uh, Amer I, I'm like staring Americans. at it right now. Yeah. Uh, Americans. Uh, <laughs> U H Americans. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's that's the mundane, right? It's just yeah. the um, it's like the re refocusing the attention on just kind of like the uh, just the the, the in between. It's so it was so perfectly named. Like, Thank did you. it take you a minute to come up with that, or did you have it? Um, I already had the name actually before. Okay. Uh, I even thought of the show. It was actually my. Uh, it was actually my. I had it. A Twitter account that I started back in 2014 because a friend of mine is like, oh, you should go and join Twitter. There's like interesting thing, you know, interesting combo uh, content over there. So I was like, all right, cool. So I was like looking for a name, and I was like, it was like Robert Frank was in his book The Americans was in my head. So I was like, right. let me just call it The Americans. It was just it's just funny and just easy. But then uh, once Harper and I had met and we were discussing about planning a show. I had actually created the painting, The Americans, where it's like the two guys sitting down and one of them has a, yeah, the Kaepernick jersey on and the other guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so I'd name it The Americans. And then I kind of realized there was like this whole significant thing that like narrative that that's attached to it as well. So, right. yeah, it kind of was a thing that it was something that I already had. And I was like, I really want to hold on to this, this name. I don't, I, it was just so cool to me. But then I kind of, later on found some sort of significance to the to the name and things like that. Yeah, I, I I found significance in the name immediately just because it felt like it it summed up how poorly history is written and also how kind of where we're headed. Did you like just kind of uh but it, it's, it sounds so simple, but it was so well yeah. done. What was what was Marcus Brutus in 2014 doing? Marcus in 2014 doing was, I was one year removed from, well, not oh, a few months 
I'd quit my job working in PR and I moved back. I, I was, I was living in New York and then I moved back to Maryland uh, because I, I was like, I just, I don't want to find another PR job. I don't want to find any sort of like <laughs> professional job for some weird reason. I was like, I, I feel like I could be an artist because my, like, the reason why. Okay, I hold on a second. Hold on a second. No, no art. You had not painted before then. No, I, I had painted before then. Okay, I, I, okay. I'd been, Step yeah, I, I'd, I'd been painting in my free time as a hobby almost since like 2012. So, which happened, I, I started painting during Hurricane Sandy. <laughs> so that, that gives a bit of history. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it was something I was doing in my free time all the time, like after work. And I just, I don't know. I just felt like I wasn't going to really realize my full potential working at a job at a nine to five kind of thing. Like I felt like I was more of a creative person, but I, I had no formal training or anything like that. So I was like, I have to find a way to have enough time, but also resources to, to kind of hone this thing. So I was like, the best thing for me to do is move back home. So I spent a few years just like working odd jobs and things like that. And then, and, and, and painting as like, I, I'm not really, I had been living in New York since the age of like 17, 18. So I had, I had no real sort of like social life in Maryland, DC. So it was like easy for me to just kind of really just like paint all literally all the time. And which, which is what I did. So self-taught. Yeah. So no art school. What was like the, I like how I was saying that so dramatic. There was really no reason for me to be that dramatic. But um, what was like, did you have like this one painting that you like tried to copy or was there something that kind of like you used as like a, like your personal muse at that time? Um, so it, I guess it started with, at the time, it was funny. I was, like, really into kind of, like, Chicano art. And I thought that it was cool. It was really cool because it just, it was a great blending of sort of contemporary, the history, traditions, and things like that. And I was like, oh, this, this is really great. And as well as, like, kind of, like, personal interests and individual personal interests. And I was like, I really like this sort of blending. And I'd like to kind of create something similar with kind of, my like with my own kind of with narratives that are more you know personal to to me so yeah. that kind of was like the early sort of adaption a adaptations of that but really like i kind of was like let me just uh learn everything i could about art history and then i just would like col i collected so many images like just would collect images in magazines or everything I saw online. I just take screenshots of videos and it was just, it was just something that felt so seamless, but I was just doing it like every second of the day. And I, you know, I'd, I'd read as much as I could, or, you know, I'd, I'd watch every artist interview possible. <laughs> uh, I'd read every artist interview possible. And from there, I kind of started to just kind of like push myself and I kind of, sort of develop my own sort of technique. Uh, yeah. As soon as I was aware of that and cognizant of, of that, then I was kind of able to like really kind of conceptualize everything. In. It's, it's interesting that you say uh, that, like, that you were influenced by Chicano artists because there is a great history and it's unfortunate that the show was just opening up at the Whitney Museum, but like the kind of... Um, social realism that a lot of Chicano artists, especially, uh, you know, in the certain kind of WPA era were so mm. prominent in influencing American artists that you, you do have like this social realist, you know, I, I would say there is a, definitely a touch of social realism in the paintings that you do. So that's a kind of, it's a cool bridge that you're sort of playing with a little bit. Yeah. Um, like when I've really felt like, all right, I got it. Um, the earlier works were kind of like really, there was like a, there was like a real sort of, there was like real mess, there was like a lot of messaging attached to everything. Okay. Um, 
but I, I, I kind of felt that was like restricted that, you know, after a while, but yeah, early, the like the earlier works that I would do were, were kind of like, there was like all this sort of history. I would try to have like all this sort of like history intertwined with the works in some kind of way. But then after a while, I was like, no, it's, it's not, it's not, I, you know, I, I kind of had a bit more focus on the aesthetics. Right. What was the moment in PR when you realized you did not want to do PR anymore? <laughs> um, <laughs> it was it was probably very early um, because like I'm like I'm not a like I, I'm a very I, I kind of like to I kind of function where I like to create really genuine sort of relationships with people, but you can't re- it, it's it's difficult you can't really achieve that much if you're kind of trying to adapt, establish a, a ton of genuine relationships with people so i was like i can't really do the forced relationships kind of thing like i i like i i so yeah it was probably around then also yeah it it, it was around then um and then kind of yeah just it, it, i i just felt like i just had like a real like uh in depth you know, think you like I was just thinking in, in depth. I was like, because I was thinking, well, maybe I'd try like a different office, a different company, a different sort of. I was like, it's 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 it's, it's all the same. <laughs> well, the reason why it, it, I asked that question because you paint, you're painting like this very uh, intimate sort of like kind of warm portraits of people in these these moments, and then PR is the complete opposite of that. By by its nature, there's nothing yeah. wrong with people who do PR. I'm not. No, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. saying that anybody on this. They're podcast. great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're great. But by nature, it's the complete opposite of kind of social realist painting. So I could see you. I could, it's like you either have to be one or the other in a weird way. Yeah, but I will say, like in in PR, and probably mo- more so, like advertising. Uh, a selling tool is storytelling or narratives yeah. and things like that. Yeah. So I, yeah. I always kind of like when people ask me, like, is there anything that, you know, you learn when in working in PR that you apply to, to your art? I was like, well, maybe it's kind of like I'm always like I will paint something outright and I'll have no like just through a feeling. And then it will be the after the fact I'll be able to kind of then sit down and look at it and, and be like, oh, here's sort of the significance to this or that and kind of just break it down sort of, you know, after I've, I've completed the work. So I'd say maybe that's something that I, that I was able to transfer from that to, to, to painting. And then how did you, so there's, there's such a weird moment where like you're painting in your studio by yourself, you're in Maryland, like you're not like, there's no expectation of what's happening. And then like, someone notices what you're doing does that for you all of a sudden you're like oh okay like i'm being noticed now i what i'm doing is resonating like did you have to kind of get yourself into a comfortable place of like now there's an audience i honestly like i was i was kind of tracking my my development so at a certain point probably like a year and a half before anyone noticed i kind of was like wait, this is, this is pretty good, you know? So, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't, yeah, like, I don't want to send me. What do you mean out. it was pretty good? Like what, what, what was it? What, what, what well, did they, it? It, it, it? It gave me some, like, I was able to look at it. I was able to like take myself out of it and like look at it from a distance. And I felt that it was something, I was creating something of value, something where, if I didn't know, if I wasn't me, I wouldn't, I would like the work or I'd be drawn to the work. So at that point I was like, I think this is great. I think, I, I think other people would also think it's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe something, maybe someone would, would, will eventually come across it, but it was probably like a year and a half before, like I, I'd already gotten to that point where I was like, Oh, this, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, and, uh, like the sole reason why I have an Instagram still, why well, I had an Instagram still in 2014, I was like this close to getting rid of it at the time. Uh, <laughs> but I, I was like, you know what? I'll just, I'll just share my paintings with like my friends from like back in New York or wherever, and and cause, and and it's like a, it's also a way of being like, oh, this painting is complete, 
because they're you know I was living with all of the work, so I was like, <laughs> how could I how right. could I really say that this work is complete? Well, I was like, well, I can just like share it on Instagram, and 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 I just kept doing that. What was the learning curve when you realized like, okay, uh, there's galleries, there's art fairs, there's all like because that's all that kind of like art fair world and like this really big burst of galleries. Like I've been at Juxpo since 2006 and it's changed almost, you know, 180 degrees since 2006. Like, did you, was there a learning curve on that front? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, or I did it like not I'm, matter? It, it's like half of it really doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Like I'll have fine. my moments where like, I'll think about it a lot. Like on, yeah, I, I would say probably, the first time it really kind of mattered to me would probably be like early this year, just because there like so many things were up in the air. There was like, it was like compared to last year in January or like in December, I had already known everything that was going to ha- take place in 2019 versus right. this year. I didn't really have much, I didn't have really much concrete. And then on top of that, as I'm like, oh, I don't really know what's going on, then coronavirus hits, and it's just like everything was up in the air. But um, I like from the beginning, I was like, you know what, uh, this is actually like before coronavirus came came about, I was like, well, this is perfect because now you can kind of create with a clear mind. Um, and then through doing so, now like I I have like a clearer vision for for 2020 finally midway through the year. <laughs> are you are you were you pro- were you productive? Yeah, I, I was very productive just because it was like because I didn't really have much of that di- much direction in terms of like what would be happening on that front. I was like all I could really control was the work. So I was like, let's let's take it back to 2015, 2016, where you were just creating just because, you know, you don't really know how, you know, where the work will exist or or anything like that. But just kind of just keep working. So that was like my motivate my like my motivating factor. And then with the with the quarantine, I was like, here's another way to just make the best out of everything, because it's like you're not hanging out with friends anymore. So it's just like you might as well just like fall in love with. You're with the painting all the time. <laughs> the you know the last four years of America has just been like stunning. But um, <laughs> do you like with the pandemic, with the emergence of what could be a really really wonderful dialogue now uh, with the George? I mean, uh, it ha- starts in an awful way with the George Floyd thing, but now like people are really seem to be trying to make trying to make sense of like what's going on with American history. Does that seep into your work? Are you pretty good at doing what you do? And like maybe in 10 years, we might see parts of it, but I don't know. I, I guess I'm, how much does current events really seep into your work? Um, it, it does, very but long, it, 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 a very long winded way. Of no, asking. no. Yeah. Um, it does, but it's not an immediate thing kind of thing. It's a, Many people reached out to me in like the past few weeks, you know, even during like the pandemic, and they're like, "Oh, how are you doing?" And I'm like, pro- "I would just say I'm processing," um, yeah. which was true. Like I, I, I just kind of process everything and how it comes out. It, uh, it, 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 how I feel feel initially during a pandemic, during you know, after the, the you know George Floyd. Is like I don't. That's not. I don't feel like that's a my initial reaction. I don't think that's a fair re- reflection on how I like to create work. So I don't mm-hmm. ever try to kind of capture the early sort of that early emotion because then it's just like it's not. It. I know three weeks removed from that, it just isn't going to connect with me the same. And because I would rather again like create something that reflects that no matter what we live with everything like we live with the positive and we live with the negative like after the conversations and all of this there is going to be a time where people are kind of going to move in a way that's kind of like we've kind of moved away from like this moment of reflection i would like to capture the fact that these 
these things still exist and they're still present, you know, in our world or in our lives. So, yeah, I'm not, I don't really like to create anything that's just like this in the moment or, you know, that in the moment. Like, cause like think of if you, if you like imagine someone made a painting after watching Tiger King, like we're so that, that feels like <laughs> 10 years ago, <laughs> you know, uh, I forgot about that. Yeah. You oh, know, so it's God. just like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Those were simpler times. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I, I'm always like, let, right. let me just be calm and kind of just process everything. And then you'll eventually find like something that, 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 you know, you'll find a way to kind of communicate how you feel. Right. And, you know, that's that's a really good point, because I and I'm glad you brought up t like the Tiger King just as a as a metaphor or as an analogy or whatever, because it would be a little bit weird if your work was like not super contemporary now. Like this is a person like in the pandemic. This is a person at a protest. Like, it wouldn't fit what you've been doing before. It would be like a yeah. real big shift in your practice. You know, yeah, it's like um, like even like back at like with Expo. I made a painting of um, Boston Celtics died of an overdose, cocaine overdose. Oh, Len Bias. Len Bias, sorry. Wow. <laughs> um, I might be yeah. the only person in the art world who might be like, <laughs> yeah. I'm proud of that too. Yeah. <laughs> Len, Len Bias, yes. Yeah, Maryland's Len Bias, finest. yes. Le yeah, Maryland's finest. Um, I made a work on Len Bias, and because you're so far removed from that, you know, that situation, that that story I felt could it could mean so many things like that could like I like I, th I was thinking about it. I was like, well, this portrait could be ind indicative of like, you know, this is the beginning. So the beginning, the genesis of, of a journey could either mean that you can un you can unfortunately crash and fall in the beginning or this could you know, you could become a Michael Jordan, which, you know, and rewrite. Right. history yeah. or something like that so i felt like if you take time and and then you address if you want to address something specifically you can then kind of develop that into a larger narrative that isn't just so focused on this one moment it was interesting because that was like the one literal i mean it was literal and what if if you knew who that was that that i've seen in your work just like oh yeah that's like you know bro like a broken promise a tragedy but also like the at a time peak talent like it's it, there's so yeah. much just in in him as a symbol and also just as like a um unfortunate you know uh casualty of drug abuse and uh and that kind of portion of like the, the story of the 80s in a, in a weird way um i it's it's funny how like i think this is another problem uh <laughs> that that, th that white people have right now is that like we keep expecting every single moment now from a black artist or we're asking black artists to be constantly protesting in the way that we think that they should be protesting. Mm -hmm. And that's again, like why I think talking to you about your work right now, it's like, nah, it's just so much more subtle and so much more about all the other things. And that's, a, a, that's your own like form of like storytelling that I think is really great. It's, it's, it's interesting because I'll have like internal conversations with myself where I'll initially kind of just be like, I want to make sure that I'm not repressing anything yeah. in terms of like, so, so I don't want it to come off as if I'm not acknowledging things because they, but that, you know, because I am, but right. it's so, it's so easy if, if you, if you don't deal with or deal with things so literally or take them head on, it can, it can come off as you're kind of just like, avoiding things but no there's 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 a purpose to kind of being patient and kind of having things sort of manifest in 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 in, in, uh, in different ways i guess it's kind of you kind of answered it like do you have like is 2020 now a year that like you you feel like it's starting to come into its own for you like because you said you didn't have anything planned but now like you have motivation or or you have maybe something going on for you that like are has has your schedule changed like are you like oh i've got a show now kind of but not really like uh, the okay. the the only way the schedule has changed is because like i want to still paint but like now i have like things that i have to do outside of painting <laughs> like with the work um that it aren't really fun uh yeah. but wait um, what's that wait what does that mean 
Well, like, <laughs> I person like personally, I really just like working on paintings, like painting on canvas. But like, I'm I'm doing like some other projects uh, and things like that with the work that are kind of that are related to the work, but not directly painting. Okay. You know, which which are great and exciting, but like I really was just like painting all the time, like when yeah, okay. whenever I want to. I also had created so many paintings up until now that it's like I can fulfill any sort of. Um, I, I've been able to just like shuffle the works around different like group shows and and like the shows that I have coming up. So there's no yeah. So because I spent the first half of the year just like you know, working, I, you know, and, and being productive that I feel like I'm in a good place right now. Um, yeah. in terms of like this, the schedule isn't crazy. Like also I don't ever feel like my schedule is crazy when it comes to art. <laughs> like making as, as, art. And and as long as it's, as long as it's on your time and you yeah. can make the art. Yeah. 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 Right. And, and make the art that I want to make. Then it's like, I, it, 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 it's, it's all, it's all fine with me. Like, You've had like a pretty solid couple years as like your career starts. Like, is are you feeling? I don't know. It's not grateful, but like, are you feeling like you made? I mean, you obviously made the right decisions going into painting, but like, are you feeling good with the attention? Because you do get a little bit of attention now. Yeah, it, it feels great. Um, you know, I like anytime someone reaches out, I like try to make a personal effort to really thank them and tell them I, I'm appreciative because I, like I started this with just my, I'm the only eyes on this. You know, I, I didn't like, I told one of my, my, my friends like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to like really just focus on being an artist like early on. But other than that, I didn't tell my family or anything like that. And so to see people appreciate the work and, and like, you know, say, you know, share, you know, share great messages about it. It's like, it's, it's a great feeling so yeah it's um like i'm very appreciative and the fact that you know i can create my own schedule or i can like this is you know i had been working since 15 in offices or like check you like cocking in and things like that so yeah. like it, it, I, I i i feel like the entire like freeness you know when it comes to to this like I, i'm always like surprised and shocked like i like i could pay my rent <laughs> <Doing this. laughs> in, in in New York City, which yeah, is not in, in New York, Yeah. <laughs> is is New York key to your career at all, or is it just that you like living there? Um, I like living there and I just felt like it was somewhere where I'd be like productive beyond just the work. Like I'd be able to like because I'd spent so much time here before I, you know, I was actually painting, I you know, I felt like I had a pretty good network base and I'd be able to I'd just be able to somehow combine my experience within the city as well as you know you know my uh my, you know my my work and and like blend the two and, and there have been crossovers like I'm meeting people from when I was you know back working in PR and they you know or whenever and kind of blending the two together so so yeah um I wouldn't say like you don't need to be in New York or anything or any sort of major city or anything like that to do what I do, but it helps. Do you take advantage of all the galleries and institutions that are there? Like, do you visit? Are you kind of a gallery hopper on a certain day or whatever? I'm, or, I'm more when, when, you, when you were able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to like live at the National Gallery of the Arts in DC. Like when I was okay. there, like that was where I was all the time. I'm more of a museum guy, honestly. Um, yeah. But yeah, anytime there's like a show that I find that's interesting, I go check it out. I try to avoid openings. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I get like, horrible social anxiety. I used to not. Now I do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, and you can't really even see the work or anything like that. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> Is that why you're but, uh, a museum guy? Because you can actually sit look at the work and you don't have to like feel this pressure. Like I'm not buying anything. I just want to walk and look yeah. at stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and like, I'm like a guy that I go, anything I do, I, I go there super early. Like I go to the grocery store before anyone's there. I'm there with the old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> like I, like I just want to, I just want to knock out in the beginning of the day, 
early as possible. Avoid the. Are large you twenty eight or sixty eight? How old I, are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's like an ongoing joke with my friends. Like I'm, I'm always like the old guy. <laughs> like yeah. I'm the old. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I try. Like I feel like that's, um, yeah. Like I just, yeah. So I yeah. I I'm I use all. I go to all the you know all the museums as much as I can. But i like if there's a great show at a gallery, I'm there as well. So were you? I was surprised at how bad most museums treated the last couple weeks, because I feel like the la- like in the last couple years, especially like. I would say since 2000, I would say like since 2010, I feel like museums have gotten better at being more inclusive. I mean, they still have a long way to go, but they're trying. Yeah. Uh, I feel like their responses on social media were really poor and I was surprised. Yeah. Um, you know, to be honest, I, unless it was something egregious that popped up at me, I wasn't looking for anyone's responses outside of the voices that I've been following that had that, that always are on top of these sort of uh, stories or situations. So honestly, I hadn't really noticed much. I mean, I had I had noticed some some people had called a few you know institutions or companies out, but I I'm sorry, like I, I have like a low bar of expectation when it comes to like if <laughs> if, if, if that's yeah. if that's not your mission, right? Then I I don't really expect much, right? You know? I, I, I will definitely admit this, and I haven't admitted it, but I'm going to admit it on, on record. Like, it was, I had a little bit of a hard time figuring out what Juxtapose was supposed to say. Besides be like, you know what? Like, we're just going to show art, which we always do, and uh, just and do, and do that. Um, but I, I didn't know if we were supposed to write, like, a manifesto. I, I didn't know. It yeah. felt like a little, because it would be awkward if we would do that. That would be really out of character for us. So I was trying to stay within character of what we've done, especially over the last, you know, last 26 years, it's all been about democratization of the arts and creating different art narratives. So why would all of a sudden we, I don't know, it was weird. That was, yeah. that was, that was an odd moment for sure. I, 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 I think it's like an awkward moment, especially for spaces that you may not be like, that may not be your main focus, but you have sort of opened of uh, the conversation as far as you know different voices it's an awkward space position to be in because you know there is also motivation to be like hey we've been doing this but then that comes off as tone deaf as well and, and it kind of <laughs> sort of focuses on yourself yeah 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 so, so yeah so honestly like i i i've always said like i like i i talk i talk to my friends every day about this and i'm just like honestly i think Whilst it may be, it may feel difficult. I think the best thing for everyone to do, like unless you have something that's pertinent or 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 you know important and that you need to share right now, I think best everything people should do is kind of just like calm down, really just digest what's going on. And if you if you're really able to kind of you know create a plan forward to kind of improve in any areas or things like that, then yeah. But other right. than that, this whole rush to to kind of making a statement or rush to, 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 to kind of making, you know, grandiose donations. It's like, it's almost to me as someone that's kind of highly critical of everything that, 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 that gets publicized, it kind of makes it seem like you're kind of rushing to brush this aside and kind yeah. of re- remove all guilt I know. from your mind. You yeah. know what I mean? No, I know. I know. And it's like, and I hate the problem. The thing that I, I hate the most is that, we were posting stuff and people were like, well, what is Juxtapose doing in the comments? And I was like, oh, okay. Like, well, we are doing stuff. I actually wasn't really going to publicize it because I didn't think we needed to. Yeah. But like, all right, so we'll publicize some stuff. But I actually, I don't like social media getting so much credit. Yeah. That's my, that's where I get really, I get really worried that like now Instagram has become the most, the only important communication device that we have. And that's where I started going, oh God, I hate this. You know, <laughs> I don't want to give, I don't want to give. Facebook and in that company that much credit, you know. Uh, but I guess it's just the world we live in, right? So, yeah, it's it's a it's a, it's a w- way we so, communicate. I guess yeah. It, but what? Okay, so yesterday you said that you were like you were finishing a painting. What does finishing a painting mean for you? Like, does that mean you were in a zone? You're like, I don't want to be interrupted. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I was I was working on on something, and I was like, 
I had a, I wasn't sure if it was going to, if I was going to continue on to the next day. I didn't actually. I completed it that night. So it, it all depends on like how I'm feeling. Like most of the time, I can complete a, a painting in like nine hours and okay. not kind of even think of it. Right. Um, after you do grocery shopping in the morning. Yeah. So that's why I knock everything out in the morning <laughs> so that I could just like okay. completely have, be free, absolved of any sort of responsibilities and it can kind of just focus on that. So, so that, yeah, so that's really what, what it is. And then, and then I kind of, I'll, I'll finish working on a painting or think I finished working on a painting, sleep, wake up, look at it the next day and then with new set of eyes. And, and then from there, I'm like, all right, that's, that's a complete work. Okay. Um, what do you know, like right now, do you know where that painting's going? No, because I had a massive collection of my works happen a week and a half ago, which sucks because I felt like that. Wait, been. what happened to it? No, no, a lot of my works got picked up. Okay, okay, okay. Half all right. Ago. Okay. Yeah, so then. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Nothing, nothing, was... nothing, nothing negative, nothing negative. Okay. Um, so those are all for a, a uh, potential solo show coming up. A group in a couple group shows as well cool. so um it the timing has been interesting because i I feel like i've created two really strong works that <laughs> that happen right after my pages get picked up but it, it's it's fine um it, it's fine they'll be all right yeah i um it's been really refreshing uh to see how the art world pause for a second and all and all these artists like making I, what I feel like is un, uninterrupted work. I know as an artist, you work on a schedule that's already slightly quarantine friendly. Yeah. But like, it seems like so many artists that I, that we've been checking in with have really seemed to find a, a good pause here where they didn't have to, a lot of the business parts of it kind of went away, which I think is interesting to see how everybody's work is going to look. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I think it's going to all be really interesting. I think, we'll see some really cool works or we'll also see like a whole new crop of artists that have been creating, like yeah. just been inside just killing it and creating like really cool works as well. Um, we're sort of, we're almost at an hour, which is like totally great. But uh, I have, okay. Recommend me a book, some sort of TV show to watch and some music to listen to, because I feel like I'm sort of getting to that point where I'm, I'm, I'm still in, pandemic mode i don't want to go yeah. out so as far as a book i will i'll just say this it, it's it's a it's a book of essays and it's also the title of my upcoming solo show that i'm having with harper soon okay and that is the truth that never hurts by barbara smith i i, I would recommend that it's an interesting take on all of these sort of uh, conversations we're having around blackness because it is through the lens of a an early black feminist okay. um, so and and she was a lesbian as well so it's an interesting perspective yeah um the truth that never hurts. never hurts yeah the yeah. truth that never hurts All you're right. really good with titles by the way of finding good titles thank you thank you appreciate it <laughs> yeah. i'm noticing a trend here <laughs> appreciate it appreciate it I don't know, man. I've I felt like we should do. I, I felt like we should we should have a talk. Oh shit! Nothing good has ever come from the words "we should have a talk." <laughs> um, no, we just we we kind of took a little break from the podcast for the last couple of weeks because it just felt like maybe we weren't the two to make the grand uh, political conversation, which I think is fair. Oh, yeah, I think. Uh... I think this is maybe a time for a bit more listening. Yeah, America seems to be once again leading some sort of civil rights charge, which is good. And I didn't realize how far reaching it was going to be. And kind of following the news in the UK, uh, I didn't realize the long history of police brutality in the UK as well. So it, it, it's interesting for you and I now to talk about because it it's both of our countries are sort of at the the forefront of this conversation. 
But, you know, in America, it's, you know, this all goes back to just this idea that we have these living, existing monuments of that, that represent slavery that are all around the country that we will just refuse to get rid of. And it just, it, it continues. And it, granted, it's nice to see some stuff coming down. You know, I'm not like Mr. Like, this is the most political of probably of, of all your friends, but uh, this defund the police thing I've become really, really into. Although I do feel like we should reuse the term and like say reimagine how money is used as opposed because every time you use the word D in front of something, like people get this negative connotation, but it's basically just reimagining what people have the options to use when they need help. I think that was its main its branding yeah. was almost just the main yeah, it, the main thing that was off. It was just like, you know, it just became so kind of like automatically divisive. Like you can't what are you gonna do? Just leave us a vacuum and we're just going back to everyone you know, everyone for himself. And it's like, actually, that's that's not what it is. Because, you know, as a 38-year-old man, I've never called the police before, ever. I've never used the police. Mm. And as much as, like, that's the privilege of a white male, that's also, like, there's a lot of, like, money behind that. Like, how many people have never used the police before, and yet they're, they're used and militarized in a way that's, like, the Defense Department? I, I'm really excited about the potential of the reimagining of how money is spent towards care for people. And that, if that's the legacy. Trump's legacy. Yeah, right. I mean, um, imagine if that was sake. Trump's legacy. Like, oh, my it fucking would just God. be so crazy. The guy that came out with so the crazy. biggest support for the military and for the police, and suddenly we're, because of him, it's all been stripped away. Really refreshing to see racists emerge on Instagram and being able to unfollow them so nicely. So good. Oh, uh, yeah. A couple of artists have set fire There's to their couple. careers. There's a couple. <laughs> in the last, Boy, in the last couple I'm not quite weeks. sure what their point was. That's the thing where it's like, hey, I, you know, you might believe your certain thing and that's, that is what it is. But like, uh, I mean, and then you're, you're a fucking idiot. But um, why did you choose to do that now? <laughs> what, is, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> why press why press the button? It's so easy to not press the button. But they did, and that's okay because now they we did, get to and see. that's okay because now we know and they fuck they can go fuck themselves. And you know exactly who we're talking about. They can go fuck themselves. <laughs> that's a message from us. How is the attitude there at the moment? It does it seem um still energized, still you know, people still seem active. I know that these things for a lot of people involved in this conversation, it's their first time being involved in this conversation. So for, right. you know, for any African-Americans or um, any any black British people that would listen to this, it's like, I'm sure this is, you know, the third or fourth time this has happened in your lifetime. So, right. you know, there, there there's a sort of a level of expectation there that this is going to come in, hit hard, and then, oh, okay, everything back to normal. You know, we've taken down a couple of statues we can go back on this one seemed a little different from what's happened before i don't know about you but it seems though it seems as though in america there was at least there was this like you know 40 million people unemployed the world had kind of put on pause because of the pandemic but the one thing that remained consistent it appeared is that the cops were killing black men in the streets for no reason so that seems to have taken an extra, you know, I think that's where I think a lot of this, you know, can stem from the fact that this one awful consistency that we have continues to happen. Um, and also, I think the video of, I mean, Trevor Noah talked about this especially, which I thought was really interesting, um, was that video of the woman in Central Park uh, with the dog mm. and threatening to call the police on a black man who was doing bird watching, like, it all these things happen at once. Even that part of this whole thing seems like a long time ago now. Things it they does. just move so fast because we we had the one in uh, San Francisco where the the Filipino guy was writing Black Lives Matter in yeah. Pacific Heights, yeah. and he's so it's like. By the way, fuck that lady um, because you know she's done that so many times. It's just that she was just oh, I just fuck that lady so much. I think she's gonna be going under the radar for a long time. Something tells me. 
She's got nothing left. There's a force that comes out now behind these people. Like you, you will have Twitter, you know, demanding blood, and 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 you know, to an extent, rightly so. She shouldn't have done this, but wow. Think about this. In this day and age, this last couple weeks in the world, you've decided to tell a person <laughs> of color that they can't stencil Black Lives Matter on a piece of property that's not even yours. Like, what the fuck do you care? Um. Shows the power of graffiti. Awesome. But it's like, do you not read the fucking room? Do you not watch the news? Like, what the fuck are you thinking? I mean, it's just like people are so up their own fucking ass. I don't know. It's shocking to me. Shocking. To answer your your initial question, it seems like it has not turned down. But I do think there is this underlying unfortunate feeling that the uh, the, the pandemic is like still ravaging. Mm. And I think there's this kind of uncomfortable conversation that people are having where it's like the more we gather the more this is spreading and as much as the gathering is absolutely needed it's so worrisome to see like what the repercussions of like i don't want people to die i don't want any more people to die i don't want like people to go home to their old to their elders and you know kill them. i don't know i just yeah. it's so i have friends so upsetting friends all here in london that were just like no, i'm not going to that i've done three months i want to be there i've had to you know i've lived my life with this this is this is something i feel incredibly strongly about but i you know it's my mom's 60th on sunday i can't go to that protest and then go down and see my mom not not with a clear conscience. but there's so many ways to support right yeah like that's that's the great thing there's so many ways to support even if you can't make it out there you feel uncomfortable with but it's like you can still give so much time and energy like i i can't go protest i've got an autoimmune disorder i really don't like I, I'm worried about that. And so I feel like I can use the platform of Juxtapose to help promote um, some really positive causes. Um, and that's how I'm I'm choosing to, to not just the protest, but just to spread some awareness and kind of positive, uh, positive impact in that way. Juxtapose is always supposed to, about, supposed to be about showing new art and we're showing new art and people are excited about it. Hmm. So it fits everything that we're about. I liked your approach. But I don't know. Like, what do you, th- what do you think? From the, from the experience that I can offer, which is of a, a, a white guy in London looking at it, I thought it was a, I thought it was a good <laughs> ex- approach. You know, um, it wasn't doing what many feeds suddenly became, which was something very different, um, you know, kind of fanning the flames of, of riot porn. And it was a little bit more considered kind of carrying on the the, the the juxtaposed way, which is, like you say, showcasing artists. And I couldn't tell, you know, if this was us getting a little insight into your flex, because you can flex on your art better than anyone. And we were seeing, you know, for us as viewers, we were getting to see like this whole other world. So I don't know if this was all just stuff that you knew or if you were out, you know, artists that you knew already or if it was artists that you were out discovering. But that was, you know, for me, I was like, look, it's a mix. We can sit and we can say, you know, I can throw up a fist and say Black Lives Matter. That's cool. I'll stand with you. But, you know, let's 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 put people on platforms. Let's showcase those artists that haven't had the pla- the chance because this is the time to do that. Showcase those artists. That was, that was an important decision. I think that you made. Well, you know, I think this is the thing too. We didn't have to get on Instagram or any social media and say, we need to be better. We need to, we need to get, we need to improve and change our entire focus, which it seems like a lot of brands did. We basically were just like, we're going to show you the best art that we can find. And this is the best art. we. I mean, you know what I mean? Like we, we didn't have to do this huge like preaching and apology that so many brands did so poorly. I don't understand how this stuff gets through this many people of mm. like, you know, checking and double checking. Like, should this be our message? Like it's some awful messaging. Um, we could just show art and that's, and let, you know, and that's what we do. So it's not like we had to reimagine the magazine the magazine is inclusive so that's just let's just let's continue let's doing up it. the ante yeah i think i, th- yeah, I, I yeah. think that was a good a, a fortunate position it was fortunate in the sense that you know it wasn't by accident it was obviously a, a conscious right. decision. yeah you know it wasn't like oh shit thank god we had you know four black guys in the in the magazine last last uh season it was like okay hang on actually this has been part of our line of thinking for for a long time it's it's part of where we're trying to go well and you're totally right because this is this is why like having marcus 
as the next podcast guest, like we, he was in the last issue. Like this isn't like, it's just, these are the people that have art, like are part of the magazine already. Like we're not, this isn't some sort of, and, and it, I know we're two white males doing this and hosting this podcast. We've got a large audience, but you and I both know that the most important thing is the artists that we interview. The, they're the star of the show, not you and I. So I think so. I think we can, you know, with something that I, I know that we've talked about, you know, since the, the start of our conversations, uh, it was always part of what we would discuss, you know, whether it was mural festivals I, I, or <laughs> shows or whatever, yeah, you right. know? Yeah. No, and you and I have always been really conscious of the fact that, like, does the world need a Scottish and Californian white dudes discussing the art world? We know we, we've had these discussions. Like, we're not naive. Yeah. We don't live. We, we actually we're not living in some bubble of like what our opinion is the most important opinion. And it's the only opinion like we I don't know. It's just that's not if anyone's ever thought that's where we're coming from. I'm really apologize because that's not where Doug and I come from. I, I, I just hope that a lot of this, you know, the, the words that are used uh, are turned into action. We can't just wait till the next, you know, uprising. So we we have the chance to do this. It has to be like you have no to make that that thing this is actually this is what annoyed annoyed me the most was please i love this no stuff, yeah. the, the art world was in parts definitely definitely silent artists came out and they did their thing and, and they stood in solidarity but they're individuals so it's where you look to the institutions the galleries the museums and things like this and i was just like i just felt that the music scene was making clear bold statements and I didn't see enough real substance coming through the art world that really energized me. I used this in Instagram as an example. It was a, a, a music uh, publication resident advisor and they had just come out with like a nine page plan saying like, look, this is where we've gone wrong. This is what we're going to do. This is, this is it. We're going to donate to this. We're going to change our editorial. We're going to be consistently aware of the roots of art the music that we talk about its roots in black music and in, in black culture now i want to see where's the galleries where's the, the 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 museums these pillars of institution where are their voices where are you standing up and saying rather than you know here's my little black square for 24 hours i'm with you back to business tell me what you're going to do to be better show me and that's what I wanted to see that I didn't I didn't get. It's one of those moments we have now to make these changes because this this energy won't be here forever. This energy will be here for weeks at the absolute most. And then yes, it will go back to business as usual, but things will have shifted slightly. You know, the Overton window moves just a little bit. Of course. Suddenly yeah, yeah. things. So it's now that these bold statements have to be turned into action, you know, rather than just saying here's my you know here's my little symbol here's me with a black person i you know had in the gallery back in 2004 it's here's me making real clear changes of about what i'm doing and i i, I wanted to see more of that kind of coming through people need to be making decisions and this is where i think what why i felt juxtaposed could confidently do what we've done the last couple of weeks and what i'm going to continue to do is that the magazine was founded on not only outsider art and comic books and all these different kind of non-traditional art forms was that we were trying to create a language that existed outside of the institutional voices that we saw and these institutional voices that you know kept carrying on these traditions that were predominantly white art movements. So juxtaposed being outside of that, all these black artists who have emerged, an artist of color who have emerged over the last 20 years, like they fit into that conversation of outside the traditional means therefore nothing that we do needs to ch like we can it's like we don't need to change our whole plan it's like you just now trenton doyle hancock doing like outsider comics and toys like we can he fits into what we already do so it's like how do you bring that language into what he does to the forefront that's already part of what juxtapose does and that's what like i'm really working on making sure that i, I learn how to do that better and I feel like all these institutions just like they've never had any sort of mission statement that is about how to be more inclusive. And that they're, it's all showing now. It's showing that they scramble and they constantly scramble to catch up to this thing. And Juxpos should not scramble because we already 
represent this outsider view of the way the art world is. Not so much as a critique, but just like what that's happening outside the institutional world. So I, I just think like these institutions or all these things in the, it's like, I don't understand why they, they their scrambling was so impar- apparent, right? And that's the thing that bums me out. So two things that Drexpose is doing right now that I just want to give like a little bit of attention to is um, we're doing like kind of on-demand print release, print releases in support of Black Earth Farms, which is a San Francisco or Bay Area based um, farming co-op that is bringing healthy organic food to um, people who need it and also project housing in the Bay Area, which is really dear to me because I, as somebody who has to think about health constantly, um, I really think that that's something that is really under (laughs) under mentioned and under supported in uh, certain communities. So I would really, that's something that we're raising money for. And we're also raising money for the Willie Mays uh, Clubhouse in San Francisco, which is in our neighborhood where our office has been for 26 years. And it's, you know, art programs for kids, um, which uh, are the neighborhood that we're based in is predominantly uh, an area of color, a neighborhood with many people of color. Um, So that's really dear to me. And to our to the owners of the company, so we're really happy about that. And then we're trying to start a fundraiser for the Museum of African Diaspora, which is a great museum here in San Francisco, um, and trying to get a bunch of different artists uh, from around the world to donate uh, prints for that, and we'd give proceeds to the museum. Hopefully, uh, certain programs of the museum that we can specify later. Um, the... The big thing that Juxpose is going to focus on until November uh, is voting. Um, So you'll be seeing a lot of Juxtapose uh, projects related to getting people to vote. And when 2008 was rolling around and Obama was running, um, myself and the gentleman who owned Upper Playground at the time uh, got really behind doing these Obama posters that, you know, whether it was Shepard Fairey's poster or other artists that were contributing to you know, Obama's imagery, um, got, Juxpose got really behind that. And then, to be honest, uh, 2016, we didn't really do anything. And uh, I regret that, just with our little voice, that we didn't get more involved in voting uh Voting uh, pushes, and I think this time more than ever, uh, voting is so important. Everybody, every state, um, and voting all the time. Voting in all the primaries, voting in the every two years for your senators and House of Representative members, president, everything. Uh, So Juxpose is really going to focus on activating our audience for voting uh, awareness. That's just... it just that's that's where change is made unfortunately is is literally just voting i mean you can protest and you can see the amount of change and action that's been taken because of these protests but never you know never make any mistake that it, like the biggest change and the biggest impact comes down to you walking into that building it, this isn't the i don't think this is the case in how you guys vote in the uk but in america like voting for your like just the the judicial courts like people who are judges and attorney like all that stuff is so goddamn important about how we enforce the law how we amend laws how we improve you know listen to people and how we improve laws like that stuff is so important it's not just the president like it's just not it's all the stuff that's down to your local county um so that's i gotta we gotta figure out and we're working on it of ways to activate people just to remember to vote this is the simplest it's the simplest right you have in democracy is voting so just let's and also like all the bullshit the fucking republicans do to block people of color from voting uh we need to work on that shit yeah you're in you're in silicon valley get an app where's the app where's the voting app man come on it's 2020 it's 2020. I don't have to. I don't, I don't have to walk down stand in in coronavirus. <sighs> but I don't want to like. Center. You don't want to vote. You don't want to vote through a Mark Zuckerberg app, do you? I didn't say it was Mark Zuckerberg. But that's what we all know. Yeah. <laughs> or Elon Elon Musk or some shit. I don't know. I mean, I give them all my details anyway. Can't be any worse. It can't be worse than anything else. 
So there you go. That just about wraps things up here for this episode. Hope we've provided you with a little respite from the hyper-stimulated world we find ourselves in. Who knows what the next week has in store for us. Till then, take care of yourself, look out for each other. Black Lives Matter.